Hi, everyone. I am excited to welcome you to today's webinar hosted by Suzy and New Hope Network. Today, we are going to be talking about the supply chain, inflation, and the food industry. Just first, some introductions. I'm Melissa Dunn. I am the SVP of Enterprise Marketing at Suzy, and I'm going to hand it over to Eric to introduce himself. Hey, thanks, Melissa. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm really glad that you decided to spend a little bit of time with us today. Thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, uh, just for those who, of you who don't know me, I'm Eric Pierce. I am Vice President of Business Insights at New Hope and Informa. Um, Melissa is going to tell you a little bit more about Susie real quickly. I just want to say a tad bit about me and my role and the team that I work with. Um, uh, I'm responsible for the Marketplace Insights teams at New Hope, specifically the Nutrition Business Journal and Next Data and Insights businesses. Um, my team and I at New Hope see it as our role. I think this is kind of a cool role to have, actually. Um, we see it as our role to help drive responsible growth in the natural and organic products industry. We do so by giving the marketplace a voice and to use to help the marketplace use that voice to inform decisions uh, that we make together and as businesses across the industry. Ultimately, it is my hope that content data and insights, the new hope platform and the work that we do can help to cultivate a prosperous, high integrity CPG retail and uh, CPG and retail ecosystem that creates health, joy and justice for all people while regenerating the planet. So with that, Melissa, uh, back to you and I'll see you guys in a minute. Great, thanks, Eric. Um, so for those of you who don't know who Suzy is, we are an agile market research platform um, and we really help B2B businesses across a number of different enterprises um, really make consumer centric decisions. So we work with all sorts of teams, R&D, innovation, marketing, UX, UI, um, and we use a qual qualitative and quantitative um, solution within our platform that really puts the voice of the consumer at brand's fingertips. So for the study that we are gonna talk about today, um, we conducted this early January with about a, a thousand Americans census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. So we're gonna get started. I'm sure this uh, piece of information is not surprising to anyone who is here today on this webinar, but food prices in the US, they really are skyrocketing. Um, prices paid by Americans in December of 2021 were up by 7% compared to a year earlier. And this is the sharpest increase we've seen since 1982. And another stat, which again, you know, for you guys who have been to the grocery store lately, empty shelves are really becoming commonplace. Um, and, you know, we wanted to really dig into why are these shelves out of everything again? It almost feels like at the start of the pandemic when, you know, everyone was grabbing up toilet paper and all sorts of personal care products, but what is actually causing this? So there's a number of issues, um, extreme weather conditions, and this is hurricanes, snow, aren't helping the situation or impacting the entire country. Um, and you know this is in turn impacting the supply chain. Also, the threat of Omnicom, obviously we've seen what this has done over the past few months in the US. Um, and, and really this means a lot of shortages at grocery stores. So the CDC obviously shortened uh, the quarantine time, but I'm sure as many of you have seen, you know, there's a lot of issues tied to labor. Um, when you go to the grocery store, the brands you're looking for are not stocked. Um, and in a lot of places, there's empty shelves. So today we're really gonna look at the food sector and how it's being hit in a number of different ways. Um, so this slide just captures obviously the factors that we're seeing, inflation, supply chain challenges, extreme weather, and then obviously Omicron, which is still very present. So today we're really gonna look at what are consumers wants and intentions amid this chaos and talk about um, their intentions, sort of the food buying habits and behaviors that are changing and how consumers are planning to cope with this instability. 
So I'm gonna pass it over to Eric. He is gonna take us through this first section. Eric, all you. All right, thanks Melissa. Yeah, um, get in a little time machine and go back two years. Um, pretty sure at the beginning of the pandemic, we all had hoped that we would be well recovered by now from all of the disruptions uh, to our business and that consumers would have settled into new shopping routines. Um, I think very few of us really saw just how long we would be dealing with some of these disruptions. And unfortunately, we're not really out of the woods just yet. Um, as we explore the impact of inflation and supply disruptions and ongoing COVID variants uh, today, let's start by first recognizing a few inalienable truths in the CPG industry. Uh, the first of those is that in normal times, the majority, and here I'm really caveating something, right, in normal times, but it's important, right, to think about how it usually is versus how <clears throat> it is right now. The majority of grocery purchasing decisions are based upon habit. They're low involvement decisions. They pretty much need to be like driving. We do a lot of things on autopilot in order to save mental processing time and effort for the things that are important. In the grocery store, the majority of decisions we make <clears throat> are pretty low involvement decisions. The second uh, inalienable truth in the CPG space is that the primary drivers of purchase tend to be taste, price, availability, convenience, things like that. For entrenched CPG brands in normal times, these truths are a gift. For challenger brands, the number one job of marketing and trade spend is to interrupt these habits and these habitual decisions to engage consumers in higher involvement decision making that may lead to a sale for them and maybe a new habit being formed in their favor. Prior to the pandemic, changing competitive landscape, the changing competitive landscape, think smaller brands out innovating bigger ones, stealing share over years, um, and cultural shifts in consumer preferences and higher order consumer values were the biggest disruptors to the CPG ecosystem. Through the pandemic, we have seen cultural shifts persisted with consumers continuing to place increasing value on health, social, and environmental issues as components of their CPG decision-making process. As we enter this portion, this first portion of our analysis today, let's take a look at where these longer-term cultural disruptors may be competing with current marketplace disruptions, think inflation and supply disruptions in Omicron, um, let's think about how these things are competing as habitual decision making is broken and disrupted um, and what this might be doing for the broader industry in creating risk and opportunity for entrenched and challenger CPG brands overall. Um, as we have seen in the past, when we ask consumers what factors are important to them when buying groceries, taste, of course, rises to the top. On a top two box base basis, taste wins. Even more important than other factors, taste is rated as most important to 88% of US consumers. In fact, no one said that taste wasn't important. There's no surprise there, right? But this simple truth needs to be revisited and kept in mind as we work through pressures created in our system by inflation, supply disruptions, and COVID because it reminds us of how consumers might make decisions when their habits are disrupted. Through the pandemic, many innovators have prioritized close-in flavor innovation that attracts consumer experimentations. Brands have been leaning into unique flavors as a way of engaging consumer interest, trial, and satisfying a consumer desire for variety and exploration. It is also a useful reminder that as we help consumers transition from the status quo to healthier, more environmentally and socially responsible products, especially in these time of further disruption to the system, that we must first compete on taste. And that might well be a good way of engaging consumers as they're trying new products because the one they typically buy might not be on shelf. In the same question, uh, we see that after taste, buying decisions are influenced by quality, price, and nutrition. Within the context of rising prices and out-of-stock experiences at retail, it's important to remember that these factors may well be the heaviest influencers as consumers consider alternative products when their habitual decision-making is disrupted. While not as ubiquitously as important as taste, quality, price, and nutrition, we do see that natural, organic, 
sustainable and local attributes remain important to consumers. In fact, we've seen this throughout the pandemic, that many of these attributes have persisted much stronger than some people thought they would early in the pandemic. In fact, uh, what we're seeing in this data, we'll show you in just a minute, is that local claims may well be, may be well suited to compete as they are often associated with those higher order values, or those, uh, sorry, those values that we showed you on the prior slide, taste, quality, and nutrition. What we see in the data from this survey is that one in three Amer American shoppers think that locally produced food is important when buying groceries. So uh, while local is not a new trend, and maybe many industry observers had assumed that local had peaks or that the peak had come and gone, that may not actually be the case. Local may well be finding new cultural attention uh, during the pandemic and with these latest disruptions. A November article by Food Dive indicates that many grocery retailers have been ramping up their efforts to source local products. And they point out that this appears to be both a response to changing consumer preferences and current supply chain issues. So this isn't just small retailers, but this is larger ones as well, seeing this as an opportunity to engage consumers and uh, fill store shelves in some ways. Ultimately, this is creating opportunities for smaller brands to fill in gaps on store shelves and to connect with and engage consumers' hearts and minds and stomachs as well, I guess. Reinforcing this point further about local, our survey conducted amid the largest increases in grocery store prices that we've seen in decades, um, our survey reveals that 30% of shoppers are willing to pay more for locally produced foods. Uh, given the long-term trends uh, and this potential pandemic and supply-driven boost for local products, it may well be that local will carry even more weight in a post-COVID world. I'm still trying to figure out if that's the right phrase. In a, hopefully we'll be talking about an endemic world before too long. Um, when we asked consumers why they buy local products, they told us they taste better, they're fresher, they're higher quality. We kind of talked about that in the last couple of minutes. Um, but they also said 61% of them said that uh, they buy them to support local businesses. And this is something that appears to be increasingly important for consumers as well. According to reporting from Pollinate, a survey, a global survey of shoppers in Q1 of 2021 that also included uh, American shoppers, reveals that 53% of consumers, pretty much globally at this point, believe that it is important to shop with local businesses, more so now than it was prior to the pandemic. So despite current marketplace disruptions, it appears that local is a steadfast trend um, and that it's one that may well continue to persist uh, through all of this. So being curious, uh, being an advocate for the natural products industry and, and really trying to make sure we understand how these longer term cultural trends are, are working their way through the system right now and whether they will persist, we decided to look at uh, uh, and ask questions about products marketed as organic or sustainable as well as local. Let's change uh, or shift our focus for a minute to looking at organic. First, let me say that regardless of what data I show you in the next couple slides, that I believe, New Hope believes, much of our industry believes that organic remains a priority for our industry. The USDA organic program is a success. Uh, sales are growing for organic, and it remains one of the best defined and managed tools that we have for achieving many of the goals that are important to the natural products industry. That said, the story for organic in this data is different than what we just saw for local. Looking at how consumers respond to questions about organic, we see that consumers are split on its importance when making grocery buying decisions. 29% think organic is important, and nearly the same number, 25%, think it's not important. When we were looking at local earlier, it was only about 10% who said local is not important to them. When looking at the broader cultural dialogue around organic, it appears that the benefits of organic is less clear to consumers. It appears that for many shoppers, there's still a lot of questions about what people are struggling, uh, that uh, questions and that people might be struggling to understand what organic means to them. Um, our data suggests that local has higher value to consumers than organic does in the current marketplace. Organic is still a value, and we need to remember that. And it may well be that making a local claim doesn't work for your, your brand, so we need to better understand organic. Organic is a great way to communicate your values as an organization, and it has a great way to have a positive impact on our agricultural and our food systems. But this analysis suggests 
that those who are committed to our organic may well need to do a bit more work to communicate the value of organic to consumers, uh, especially to a broader consumer base who is increasingly interested in the broader uh, sector of natural and organic products in the market. Price is also a concern and a potential barrier for some consumers when it comes to buying organic. That's going to be important for the context we're in right now. Here we see that 68% of shoppers say that they don't buy organic because of cost. Let's make this relevant to the specific this specific moment in time. Think, if you will, again, about fundamentals. Think about the value equation for a moment. Value equals quality divided by cost, right? It's a little oversimplified, but that's the idea. If quality is defined in part by the benefits of organic and it is perceived and the perceived benefits are not clear enough to consumers um, and they're not clear enough relative to the relatively uh, high price premium that one pays for organic products, then the perception of value suffers. Within the context of grocery price inflation and poorly understood benefits to organic, at least for some consumers, the already challenged value equation for organic is being strained um, even more than it normally is. Organic is aspirational. Organic is perceived as better, um, but not everyone has a clear enough understanding of why. So when the price equation, uh, uh, when the price doesn't match an expectation, expectation, it's harder for people to rationalize the price. To expand organic, especially in the face of inflationary prices, we may need to double down our efforts to communicate the value of organic to consumers. To be clear, I remain optimistic about organic. Our industry remains engaged in using organic as a tool for solving problems with our food system. But in the face of rising prices, we must recognize the need to communicate effectively with consumers about the benefits of organic. Uh, with that, let me hand the mic back to Melissa to take us through our second chapter. Thanks, Eric. Um, so we're now going to talk really about food buying behaviors, and I'm sure there's you know, it's very interesting to think about what consumers say they're going to do versus what they are actually going to take action on. So people say that they want to buy local, organic, sustainable, but the question is, do they actually buy it? Um, in the past, we've explored consumer intention around healthy eating, and we're now going to talk about the shopping trends. Eric just shared that 29% of people think organic food is important but are they in fact buying it? So the organic produce sales continue to you know, show strong increase. I think the question becomes, will these numbers continue to be supported as COVID cases remain high and these other factors that are coming to play as far as inflation and supply chain issues and the increase in costs of certain food in the market. Um, but if inflation keeps rising, Will you know organic or local or sustainable be the first to go? Um, this stat shows that one in two people actually said they would forego food if the cost is too high. If they're having to make a trade-off between what they purchase, um, it seems as if organic might be the first place that they cut. In addition, there's along with other organic products, there's data that shows that there's other foods. Um, that will increase in cost for 2022. I think some of these probably more expected than others, vegetables, steak, chicken, but things like, you know, cereal and mayonnaise may, you know, be a little surprising as far as the trends of what we can expect. Um, and within that, you know, people say they want local and organic, but there is in fact a gap between what they say and what they do. And this is really called, you know, value action gap. And it's all around, you know, them thinking about their values and attitudes and what they say they do, but are they actually um, the behaviors that they're actioning um, in the moment? So we looked here, um, you know, in 2022, people, this is all about resolutions. So people said, that they wanted to eat more local, more organic, more sustainable. Um, I think the interesting part of these stats, we can infer potentially a few things. One, um, women may already be eating um, more healthy, if you will. 
um, since the stats here are lower as far as what they are actually making resolutions around. I think the other part of the coin, um, which again is an assumption, but you know, 70% of um, women in are primary, primarily the household shopper. So are there, is there a correlation to if a woman is in the grocery store and buying product, um, is she less likely, you know, to purchase these things just because of the prices? But I think in general, we're seeing men, um, you know, get more invested in healthy eating. Um, and the question is, is, you know, will this change and uh, products leaning into these categories actually continue to grow? So when it comes to these resolutions, uh, people say one thing and they actually do another. Ultimately, cost is driving, I think, a lot of these behaviors and decisions as we're seeing some of the, obviously, factors in the U.S. as to why food prices are increasing. But in this, 30% say sustainable brands are important, but in fact, 41% of them are actually going to forgo these products and brands if the cost is too high. So cost, I think, is really a factor, especially in this moment in time, um, as we are seeing changes in the marketplace, the question becomes, will they continue for the future? So consumers want to buy sustainably, but they often don't. So what is the long-term impact of this? And um, you know, does this change the trend that we're seeing? Um, it's been a truth for decades, but, you know, things are definitely adjusting and changing. I think people are more um, likely, as, you know, Eric talked about, to look at, um, you know, organic, local, and sustainable as a new way of life as far as what we are seeing. So 41% of people want to eat healthier, and there's a tension that we see time and time again in our research that people want to, in fact, do this and are committed to doing this, but it's not always easy. Um, behavior change is definitely happening, um, but it's happening slowly. And, you know, there's a belief structure that's there, but these changes are typically happening category by category and over small increments of time. So, you know, I think people have goals of eating healthier, but then they look also at other ways of how do they become more sustainable or how do they tap into products um, that make sense for this for them. And I think you know, over time, these things are happening, but it's just, you know, it's a sort of a slower build, if you will. So this is a quote um, from Steve Lutz, who's the SVP of Insights and Innovation from Idaho Falls. Um, and really, this is about organic food that's becoming more attainable um, because the, the price gap is narrowing. So it's not as expensive as it once was in comparison to non organic food. So as product availability for organic, for local, for sustainable is increasing and the price gap is narrowing, this is really making the organic, local and sustainable food area more approachable for people. Um, while it might be aspirational, I think what we're starting to see is that more and more Americans are having access to this type of food um, more readily. And there's also a emphasis on health availability and pricing that is going to continue to drive these trends um, and sales in the long term. So we still see that natural organic products are um, have a you know a huge potential despite these current changes. Um, so the Natural Products Expo East here, this headline, you know, it's still on track to be a $300 billion industry by 2023. But just in the moment that we are in, we may see some shifts due to the, all the factors that we've talked about. Inflation and supply chain are obviously those things. And so the short term struggle might continue to be there. But you know, as we are starting to see, I think the long term um, goal of people continuing to eat and have lifestyles that support these types of foods um, is definitely going to continue to grow in the immediate, 
90% of grocery shoppers are noticing these higher prices. I'm sure if you are shopping yourselves, you've noticed the increase that you are seeing with you know, brands and certain foods that you typically buy. And as Eric mentioned, sort of challenger brands and smaller brands, I think are giving an opportunity at this point in time to compete um, when maybe they hadn't. And 42% have frequently noticed that food products are actually unavailable when they are in the grocery store. There was a lot of conversation over the last month or so about how both orange juice and cream cheese shortages are, you know, a big thing that is, um, you know, happening right now in the U.S. And you think about, you know, a cream cheese alternative uh, on the Suzy side, we've seen a huge increase in plant-based um, options. So, you know, probably a non-dairy option to replace cream cheese may be, um, you know, a way for some of those challenger brands or brands that are really starting to look at, you know, what people are doing from a health perspective and, and they have a seat at the table now um, if something like cream cheese is not that available. So I am now going to hand it back over to Eric and he's going to talk through uh, the instability related to consumers' plans. Yeah, yeah, all right. So, yeah, let's shift from talking a bit about local organic and the sustainability themes we've been talking about and um, talk instead now about how consumers are likely to cope with some of the instability in the marketplace that, that they're experiencing uh, because of this perfect storm of COVID and inflation and extreme weather and, and supply challenges. Um, so we asked uh, people what grocery shopping habits they picked up recently that they plan to continue in 2022. In their responses here, we see that one in three shoppers plans on using coupons in 2022. Increasing your trade spend, offering coupons and discounts uh, may be an important, maybe it's kind of an obvious, but you know, again, we're, we're revisiting some fundamentals in these times, uh, maybe an important way of, of connecting with consumers breaking through and getting noticed uh, when they experience, you know, disruption in their habitual decision making uh, when at the grocery store. We see examples here of Kroger utilizing personalized offers and coupons through its e-commerce platforms in order to do just this, uh, combat consumer experiences of grocery price increases in the store. Uh, they're using data to do so in a, in a very targeted way to individual households with things that they think will help keep them loyal uh, and coming back to the store, but also to help diminish their perception that prices across the store have gone up. Um, another way consumers are coping in this environment uh, may be for consumers to curb their impulsiveness at the grocery store. Uh, we see evidence of this in the 32% of consumers who tell us that they plan on writing shopping lists before going to the grocery store in 2022. Uh, not only is this an individual strategy for managing your grocery budget, but it is also one that's being reinforced in the media as a tool for managing rising uh, grocery costs. The challenge here for challenger brands and many natural products retailers is that exploration, novelty seeking, and trying new things is a key component of industry growth. It's the entry point for new brands to gain access to source shelves and it drives basket size for retailers. In fact, discovery is often the key point of differentiation for natural products retailers over their larger chain or digital competitors. So this is really challenging for them. What does this also mean for brands? Um, I would challenge you to think about what can your marketing team do to help ensure that you're on people's shopping lists in 2022? How can you overcome decreased exploration and discovery in the grocery store? How can you compete for space on the shopping list if consumers are going to be focused more on that shopping list and less on exploration? How can you dislodge or uh, not only a competitor from the shelf, but maybe an adjacent product on one shopping list, right? Consider brainstorming with your marketing team ways for fulfilling a need for consumers um, that helps them manage their spending, reduce impulsiveness, while enabling exploration and trial of new things. 
maybe recipe cards in the store will help create some more of this discovery opportunity, giving them something rational that feels good. They're not really being impulsive, but instead they're coming home with a menu plan or an idea. Uh, maybe social media can help influence the shopping list, right? Not necessarily just a, an exploration, but a, a new recipe or menu or a shopping list item uh, to put on there. What ideas do you have? This is an area for all of us to think about and revisit um, as, we, as we explore and uh, experience the challenges that we are in the market. Finally, we also found that in 2022, uh, consumers simply want less across the board. Uh, maybe less is a coping mechanism. We asked consumers what food uh, resolutions they made uh, for 2022, and we found that 28% say they want to waste less food, 28% said they want to eat out less, and another 20% said that they want to spend less on groceries overall. So all of these things are going to be opportunities or challenges for us to think about in terms of how we respond to the market. While one could look at this uh, wanting less as a commitment to sustainability, the reality is at this point in time in this environmental context is that most of this or a lot of this is probably a rational reaction to empty store shelves and higher prices and other economic and health pressures that people are experiencing in the market. As we pointed out at the beginning of our discussion, the market is once again facing unprecedented disruptions. I think I've made a resolution not to say unprecedented, but now I'm saying it again. Um, with this market instability, we will see disruptions to consumer buying habits. And in these disruptions, there's both risk and opportunity. In this disruption, there is a need for us to think about the fundamentals, right? To look with fresh eyes at what we believe to be true and what really drives consumer decision making at shelf. Um, and at the same time, while responding to the short-term pressures that we are experiencing in the system, we need to remain steadfast in our commitment to and our trust in the resilience of larger, longer-term cultural shifts towards healthier and more socially and environmentally responsible CPG industry. Again, these larger cultural shifts have proven resilient through past economic downturns and throughout the pandemic. Um, and despite increased pressure from dis supply disruptions and inflation, we believe that persistence um, will be sort of the future of these things as well. So again, we've seen these trends persist through past economic downturns. We've seen over the past two years that they've persisted through all of the, the pain and the pressure that we've been through as a country and a, a global group um, in the pandemic. And we believe that this means that we can have confidence that these larger term shifts will persist uh, through these pressures as well. So back to you, Melissa, to take us through the conclusions. Sounds good. Thanks, Eric. So just some conclusions that we have pulled together based on all the data and the information that we shared. So, you know, local, organic, and sustainable all continue to be interesting to consumers, but local really still carries more meaning and maybe in some ways more understanding than organic um, when consumers are shopping. Um, and to bridge the gap between consumers' interests in these things and the likelihood on purchasing them, brands really should focus on the availability and pricing. And I think there's a few brand lessons here based on some additional research that the Suzy team did. We recently published a white paper around uh, pricing holistically, and we found that Obviously, 73% of respondents in the study were concerned about rising food costs. Um, and, you know, we asked what can brands do to really in, you know, lean into some of the challenges and some of the things that came back um, were quite interesting. I think, you know, being honest. So just being really transparent about um, costs associated with increases um, authenticity goes a long way with consumers and the brands that they love and trust. And if they know that, you know, increases are due to paying, um, you know, workers versus the CEO, um, that is a reason why they may stick with your product. And they're also, rather than being surprised by what the price is, they're just more aware of what's happening. I know Pepsi put something out that they were being very transparent about increases and that obviously goes a long way. 
Um, Eric talked about coupons. We're seeing coupons and loyalty programs. They're really a tried and true method. Both um, physical as well as digital coupons still have a lot of place um, you know, in the world for consumers and they're looking for um, some of those ways to offset the cost. Um, quality improvement, so if a brand is, you know, making their product more, you know, quality, so talking about what that value is and really expressing that um, to consumers, again, goes a long way. And then I think the other piece is just looking at your target audience. So, you know, can you find ways of expanding to different groups um, just based on some of the challenges that we're facing? Is there a group that has more disposable income that would be able to pay for some of these prior heist, higher priced um, foods. You know, it's definitely something to consider um, as brands are facing these challenges. And finally, um, really, you know, the health and wellness conversation, I think goes a long way here. We've seen in the short term that there's definitely, um, you know, impact to brands as far as how consumers are spending. But I think ultimately this health and wellness trend um, around local organic and sustainable, it is growing and I don't think it's going away. And maybe in this moment, um, people are being hesitant to pay for some of these higher priced items. But ultimately I think this trend, obviously we saw what you know the industry is looking to get to from 2023 for a $300 billion industry. There is so much growth to be had from a long-term planning perspective that we believe that this will continue to flourish and grow. So with that, we wanted to open it up to any questions that the audience might have. Great. Hey, Melissa, I think we forgot to tell people they can put some questions in. So um, within the platform, there's a, a Q&A box. Um, go ahead and drop your questions in. I think we've got a few in there already that we can get started with. But um, we do have some time to, to hang out with you guys and, and answer questions. So please uh, go ahead and, and submit some in there. Um, well, so was there one that we've got already that stood out to you that you wanted to start with? Yeah, I think um, this first one, are there any products or brands that you think people rem will remain loyal to no matter what the cost? Um, you know, I think really this feeds into brand loyalty of product. So there are plenty of brands that, you know, in our further research that we really found that people are going to be committed to buying and are going to continue to buy based on the relationship a brand has created with the consumer. But I think honestly, these are a lot of sort of, you know, brands that are everyday brands that, you know, food brands that people are buying, you know, whether it be certain milk types or, um, you know, certain cereal types, or, you know, I think, there is obviously a loyalty that um, consumers have to brands. And I think these are a lot more of sort of the day-to-day -day staples, if you will, um, that we, I think, see just some of these aren't going away. Um, maybe some of the more novelty brands or things that people splurge on definitely are probably things that people will be more likely not to buy. But I think there's it's really about the loyalty that a brand has created with a consumer um, and what we're seeing as a way of keeping that connection um, in this time. Yeah, and I, I think there's actually some data here that's kind of interesting just to shed some more light on that. Um, from, from the survey that we just did, uh, we asked people, um, when a product isn't available at grocery, what are they likely to do? 31%. Um, uh, possibly consistent with your saying here, you know, 31% went without making the purchase. So they probably just decided that if, if their brand or if their product that they were looking for wasn't available, they would wait until it was possibly 28% though found a substitute. So this was an opportunity where it's like, Hey, if it wasn't there, 
I'm picking something else up. Um, now we don't have this by category. That would be, you know, really the best way of seeing where this loyalty exists and how it differs by category. But 24% also said they went to a different store. That's a, that's a pretty extreme expression of, you know, a, a commitment to a particular product or, or brand that you might be looking for. 9% looked online, 7% um, returned back to the store later to see if it was available then. So the, a lot of suggestions of that kind of loyalty, that momentum, the strength of that habit that we've been talking about suggested in, in a lot of this. And, you know, that 28% who, who found a substitute is also, is also a real risk. Um, in my family, sometimes it's the condiments or the brand of toilet paper or Kleenex that we've gotten really used to that is the stickiest, things that have a real personal preference tied to them. And I would imagine that's similar for, for others, not just in those categories, but um, there are some products that are really, really sticky because they are hard to replace from a flavor or experience standpoint. Yeah, and Eric, I actually just pulled up some of the data from our white paper where we asked, you know, what products and brands would you purchase no matter the cost? So there were two categories, comfort foods and specialty foods. So within comfort food, brand, brands that were mentioned were Kraft, Kellogg's, Coca-Cola, and Oreos. Those were very popular responses. And then as far as the specialty foods, and I mentioned this before around the vegetarian and vegan products, um, but Morningstar, Impossible Foods, and Oatly, those have obviously, you know, had a tremendous, I think, increase in the market um, as people are looking for alternatives to be healthy. We've seen with a lot of our brands that are using Suzy, we have a lot of plant-based brands um, that are, you know, really doing a ton of consumer testing, as I'm sure everyone sees what trend is happening in the market. Um, but I think those have become tried and true brands as well uh, for consumers as they're making choices in this space. Yeah. You mentioned consumer testing, and that was actually part of my thinking with regards to one of the other questions here. So the question is, how can we align our marketing messaging around organic to show that the price gap is narrowing. And um, as I was seeing that question and you were talking, you know, my thought was really going to two things in response to that. One, um, there's a lot, I think there's a much more nuanced and broader conversation that brands can be having about organic. For, for a very long time, the primary message about organic has been driven by the environmental working group's approach to talking about organic as an avoidance of pesticides, which is a powerful and important message and a strong reason for, for shopping organic. But a lot of the messaging has been fairly unidimensional. Uh, it has been about, hey, here's the, the dirty dozen, you know, produce items that you should be avoiding because of the pesticide, pesticide residue that, that's left on them. And so in order to reduce your family or yourself, your exposure to it, that's, that's the way, that's the thing you should do. But that's kind of pushed organic and the conversation and consumers understanding of organic into produce only or into just a small subsegment of the produce products out there, that dirty dozen as an example. Um, and I think that increasingly we can talk about the environmental benefits, the, the farmer benefits, the community benefits. Um, yes, also the health benefits of organic. And, and that takes me back to the point of consumer testing. As we try and um, narrow that gap, as we try and create more clarity in the benefits of organic, I think key is understanding your customer and your brand and figuring out what what of the variety of different messaging types best align with your brand, your product category, and your, cust your core customer, and then be consistent in communicating the value of organic, you know, at the alignment point of those several different factors and understanding both your brand, but also your customer base is, is important in, in doing that. Um, and I think you can also think about a broader communication of organic. Maybe you lead with one key message on your packaging, and then you have a broader discussion of the value of organic um, and its benefits um, on, on your website or in some place where you can engage a, a more engaged consumer more deeply. And I see another question around just how can consumer trust, how can we keep consumer trust when products aren't there? And again, I think 
I talked a bit about this at the end, but I think it's really about, you know, that dialogue with your consumer base, your loyal customers specifically, um, you know, giving them, you know, honest information about what they can expect when they expect it, if there are alternative ways to buy, obviously, you know, e-com or direct to consumer is, you know, an option for sure. But, you know, the big, bo big box retailers or grocery stores that people purchase at, and, you know, if they can't find your food, it's offering up another solution as far as where they can actually, you know, find the products that they love um, and, and trust. So, Again, I think it's really just about communication, authenticity, being honest, um, and, and that really goes a long way with loyal customers um, as a way to keep them around as we see inflation continuing um, to increase and, and these out of stock um, products, you know, giving them alternative places to look um, so that they can stay engaged. Yeah. Yeah, for larger retailers and brands, I don't know that I have a solution here for for smaller ones, but we have new data to work with that we haven't had before, you know, in, in an environment like this. And I would imagine there has to be a way to connect um, at the individual level, knowledge of who's buying what brands and what stores are experiencing out of stocks to potentially implement some kind of, you know, digital couponing, rain checking type program or something like that, that would be a way to do some of that communicating with people. It can be so hard to know who to communicate with and how in this sort of auto stock environment. But again, if we can utilize loyalty club programs, uh, past purchasing data, whatever it is we have, and marry that up with, um, with our knowledge of where we might be out of stock in which stores, uh, inventory systems, I know it's way harder than, it, <laughs> than I'm making it sound. But if, the, if we really stay in this, this level of disruption for a long time, there might be some really innovative new ways of implementing a digital rain check type program like uh, like we used to have with a physical rain check for for anybody who showed up and found an empty you know out of stock shelf um, in in the old days of retail. I don't know if rain checking still happens or not, but anyways, uh, just a crazy old idea there. I'll give another plug. We've got a couple minutes left. If there's any other questions, feel free to drop them in. I think we've got one or two more we can work through, but please, um, please do submit them. Uh, you can go uh, as far afield as you like, and, and you've got some time with us. So, so let's throw something out there. So there's one question here, which um, we don't have the data for, but it doesn't mean that we cannot um, we cannot get it. Um, it was around whether or not we've conducted any research or come up with projections regarding how long it would take for the market to return to normal, or will there be a normal in the coming years, meaning, meaning a permanent impact? So. Um, we have not run data on this, and it wasn't part of this particular survey, but I think it's a very interesting question. And, um, you know, we definitely have the means of sort of going back and, and getting some answers to that, um, you know, and I think that would be interesting. Eric, I don't know if you guys have uh, seen any information or run any research around just um, what what we think the long-term impact is going to be, but I think it's a very interesting question, um, you know, for, for brands and consumers. Yeah, we haven't done so with regards to the current supply chain challenges and inflation that we're dealing with. Um, we did a lot of modeling um, for the impact of the pandemic, you know, on, on overall sales or sales by category in certain spaces. Um, and and the story really did matter quite a bit by what category one was in, uh, but uh, we have not yet started that or done anything like that with regards to the current disruptions um, related to inflation and supply chain. Sorry, I'm looking at a couple more of the questions here.
Um, there's a question here. Maybe that I need a refinement. Um, unless Melissa, you you understand the context of this one. I read an article that suggested a move towards IT. Uh, did the survey provide any data behind uh, that being a real pivot? And the IT is not standing out to me as as clear. So, um, Tracy, if you want to submit a, a refinement, or or maybe Melissa, you you've got you've got it figured out. I had the same feeling. So Tracy, okay. maybe Tra just will you just spell out? Is it IT for us? Uh, Jeffrey, sorry if somebody didn't reply. Um, I believe the deck will likely be sent out uh, by the Suzy team um, following the event. So you'll probably keep an eye on your email, whichever email you use to register for, for the event, uh, for those who are looking for the, the deck. Uh, Tracy responded, robotics. Okay, thank you. Um, so I read an article that suggested a move towards robotics. Uh, did our survey provide any data on that being a real pivot? Um, this survey definitely did not get into that, um, and I'm trying to think about sort of if I have any perspective on that outside of, you know, um, fulfillment and the enhancements, you know, that our products are bringing to, to fulfillment processes within the supply chain. I'm not sure I have a, a perspective to share on that. Is there anything that you guys have, Melissa? I don't think so. All right. Thank you, Tracy. Sorry. Um, all right. As a brand, should I raise my prices? My cost and labor went up, or should I swallow and keep my prices and stand out against the competition with better prices? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, oh, my goodness. Uh, Clearly, it depends on the, the health of your business and where you're at. <laughs> and so I don't think there's any uh, right answer that one can provide from, from the outside like this uh, without really understanding. I think it is a legitimate strategy to consider in this, in this environment. If you have, uh, um, you know, if, if, if you have the finances to allow for that and, and you can remain in stock, you know, with a, with a lower price competitive position, um, that could be that could be a real a real benefit. Um, I think if you are raising, you know, keeping your price low and at risk of out of stocks, it's entirely possible consumers won't notice, and you'll you'll just end up missing out on on the revenue potential that you really need to support your business. So, I of course think about the health of your business. Think hard about that as a strategy and whether or not it's consistent with your broader strategy or not, uh, and whether it's a useful tactic at this at this moment and and again it has to be thought about in terms of you know what is your supply chain like will will people actually be in a position to see that you've you've priced differently for you to get the benefit you're hoping to get from that um, but again anything that can be done right now i mean that idea is not so far off from other things we suggested of, of discounting you know in an environment where people are seeing higher prices um, discounting and other things could well be a way to, to resonate with a, a real pain that consumers are feeling right now, which is pretty dramatic increases in prices. The 7% number I think you shared, depending on your category, certain categories, I've seen numbers as high as 15 and 20 some percent, you know, uh, increases by, by certain categories. And so um, it's, it, it is a real pain consumers are noticing and experiencing. What was our number? What 40 some percent of people said they had experienced or seen price increases within the store. Is that right, Melissa, or at least close? Yeah, I think so. I think it was 42, around yeah. 42. Um, and I would just offer a little insight on this as well. I think, you know, as Eric said, it, I think it really depends on supply chain and what your business is capable of sustaining. Last week, we had a webinar on the Suzy side um, and one of our clients, Mark Recton from Kilbasa Smoked Meats joined and, you know, he gave an example, you know, they are a smaller brand, but they are known for their quality and they really can't sacrifice quality and then ultimately price, um, you know, in their production. So they're not a brand that can basically make sacrifices um, you know, or reduce cost because of the product that they are selling there. I think, you know, one of the top in their category. So for them, 
it is about that value exchange that they provide to their consumer. Obviously, you know, bigger brands, um, you know, that have a number of different categories and brands, I think even within them, um, you know, they may have potential to sort of offset a cost of a product with another. But I think just based on the size of the business, where you sit in the competitive landscape of your products, I think a lot of it is going to be circumstantial um, and case by case, just given, you know, the production elements as well as even the brand perception elements. Yeah, yeah indeed. Um... We had one question left, I think, unless somebody wants to sneak something in. Um, I might have been avoiding it, because I don't know if I've got a good answer for it. Katie, maybe you do. Um, are there any foods that you think will become more popular uh, during this time? And I was struggling with this one myself. Um, so the interesting part is I think if we think about even the beginning of COVID, obviously people were, were snatching up, um, you know, frozen foods and things like that. Frozen foods, in my mind, are actually, you know, I think even a hard thing to find when you go to the grocery store now. Um, but you would, I think the things that were staples um, you know, I, I think even those are hard in itself as far as what consumers are able to find. Um, obviously, the, the shelf life of a frozen vegetable or fruit is much longer than, you know, fresh. But I think the challenge is even just finding some of those staples that we all rely on that are going to continue to be, um, you know, in people's lives for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Yeah. And I normally I would predict I like that a lot. It's um and and normally in economic downturns I would predict, you know, more cooking at home, more basics, you know, fewer of the embellishments, so so maybe more produce, more um of the perishable, you know, ch cheaper perimeter things that that people can cook entire meals out of except for we've been through two years of people having to cook more from home and they're, you know, many of them are tired and excited to get yeah. getting back out to more regular routines. And, um, and so I, I'm not so sure that's my prediction in this case. Um, I think we'll see some of it, but will it change in the, in the net? I don't know. Um, we did get one last one come in here. Uh, what does organic? Uh, what does the organic industry need to do with consumer education? Is the issue that consumers don't understand the difference um, from organic farming compared to conventional farming? Um, I do think the it's a little bit. You know, the conversation about organic is a little bit inside baseball right now. It's a little technical for people to truly understand, and most people don't spend much time thinking about you know agricultural practices or understanding them you know one thing i might look to is the energy that the regenerative organic um and the regenerative uh farming um sort of movement is trying to use to engage consumers and they're they are experimenting with other ways of talking about agriculture in a way that they hope will connect with consumers and it it does invoke ideas of soil health and climate change. It invokes ideas of having um, more sustainable business models for farmers. It's experimenting with lots of different messaging. And so I think that might be my primary message is that we need to think about, well, what does organic offer and how can we ladder that up to something that consumers do spend at least a little bit of time thinking about um, and, and maybe the conversation about improving our soils is not a conversation consumers spend a lot of time thinking about. But how can we connect that to to sequestering carbon and, and, and to conversations about climate change? How can we cha take that soil conversation that Regenerative is having and is at the foundation of organic and use that as a way of talking about helping farmers, you know, and and also then a path towards reducing the need for synthetic inputs into the farming system. So I think it's about laddering up what we know of organic to something that consumers can or will engage with. Um, that's that's probably the core of my answer. It's not easy, but that has to be, I believe, the, the path towards communicating differently. Melissa, any final thoughts you want to share? We're we're just just shy of time. 
No, but I, Michael's question was interesting, just given the conversation we had yesterday when we were prepping around, you know, organic versus local. And I think, Michael, it's, it is a really interesting point because, you know, something, obviously the word local is just much more intuitive um, to people and they understand that it's coming from their community. And I think making organic uh, have more of a connection to the consumer. You know, I, I loved Eric's suggestion of just broadening it up to sort of a larger, you know, story, because I think those are things that consumers care about and they're passionate about, um, but also just making sure we do really help people understand what does that mean and why is it important? Ultimately, the benefits of organic, that also might be a way of thinking about how to, you know, when I say organic, what does that ultimately mean for your nutrition, your, your health, um, you know, the things that you are actually getting that are gonna continue to, you know, make you live a healthier and longer life. Um, so if there's ways of even connecting that word with, you know what it's doing for a consumer i think in a lot of ways then they understand both the larger scale impact of what eating organically is doing for the environment and our world but also sort of to their own personal health and well-being um and it's a it's a really good question and something i think you know definitely needs more education in this world um to make sure people understand yeah. Well, I always just pulled up one last final number or last thought I had um, in the survey we have here. Only 32 percent of consumers feel that they are confident that they'll be able to keep up with the rising pro prices of groceries. 14 percent say they absolutely don't feel like they can. The rest are kind of uncertain. So, you know, as far as numbers go, that expresses real pain in the marketplace. And I would just challenge all of us to think a little bit about how do we respond uh, to that consumer need in the market um, and do so in a way that's consistent with our values and, and how we serve, but also reflecting the, the current market environment. So, Melissa, thanks so much for uh, doing this with me today. This is a lot of fun. Thank you, Eric. This was so fun, and hopefully we can do it again soon. Thank right. you to everyone for your wonderful questions. Um, they, they were great, and I think happy to see that the data in here is sort of percolating thoughts because um, I know it's doing it for me as well. Great. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Yeah.